Hi, welcome to video seven. Um, this is the second part of talking about the first time we bent the laws of ecology. So the second video talking about the agricultural revolution. Um, last time we talked about when it happened, 9,000 BC. We talked about why to more securely uh, to more securely meet our needs for survival, specifically food. We talked about the results, the fact that all of a sudden we have bigger populations, which means we have strangers. We have more possessions, which means we have inequality. We have more um, a more complex society with uh, more roles people can play and more complex beliefs. And now what we're going to talk about is the consequences of that. Um, so um, we are going to talk about, first of all, I think we're going to talk about four consequences that come of this. Um, let's begin with the idea of uh, the agricultural revolution raises the human standard of living. All of a sudden, We've got wealth for the first time in our in our existence, um, and this is good. Uh, we've got, I mean, again, we're taking advantage of that right now with us communicating via computers, via technology, via um, uh, the digital technology that takes this over. Uh, at, you know, first uh, waves that travel through the air and then through wires to get to you. Uh, it's amazing what we have, um, but. And the second part of this is that with the raising of the human standard of living, let's not lose sight of the fact that we're still animals. We still live in an ecosystem. Yes, we've bent the laws, and now instead of having 100 people, you can have a million people or more in a specific place. That's astounding. I mean, that's a really an amazing accomplishment. Um, what it does in terms of us, though, as animals, because we still, even though we've bent those laws, we still are subject to them, is it makes possible a qualitative collapse. In other words, it changes the way collapse can work. For every animal species, you can collapse quantitatively. The number of organisms that can be supported in an ecosystem can collapse. But once we have elevated ourselves out of hunter-gatherer into agriculture, and then from agriculture into industrial, and then from industrial into this sort of post-industrial digital society, we can also collapse by falling back down. It's hopefully not going to happen, but it's certainly possible that we could we could um, overshoot our carrying capacity and destroy our possibility to have an industrial society and have to go back to an agricultural society where you don't have the choice of being a, of, you know, being a computer programmer or whatever it is that you're going to be, where I don't have the choice of being a college professor, where I have to be a farmer. It's, Again, unlikely that that's going to happen, but it's certainly possible that I could end up with a qualitative collapse, a collapse, and I should have defined this, a reduction in standard of living. So this idea of a qualitative collapse is a reduction in the standard of living. Even if I may not become, you know, may not have to become a farmer or heaven forbid, a hunter or gatherer, it's also possible that I that we lose the capacity through climate change for me to have my own car. Right now I have a standard of living where I can get in a car and travel 60 miles an hour, which again, based on us as an animal species, is kind of incredible. Um, whenever I want to. And it's possible not super likely, but possible that we could overshoot, drain the uh, resources of our ecosystem to such an extent that I can't do that anymore, or I'm not allowed to do it as often, or I'm not allowed to have air conditioning, or whatever, that my, my energy needs can't stay at the same level. Again, I'm not saying this is inevitable. I'm saying this is a possibility that is created by 
the agricultural revolution and its, its um, raising of the human standard of living. Okay, so we've got those two ideas. It raises the standard of living and it makes possible a qualitative collapse. Uh, the other two that I want to talk about, the other two consequences, are first of all, that it doesn't just create inequality, but we talked about that. It creates inequality because all of a sudden we've got possessions and feelings of superiority and inferiority in a society. Uh, particularly, these feelings of superiority and inferiority toward other people. Remember, before the agricultural revolution, you know everybody. You have a degree of intimacy with everybody. Then at the same time, we expand our society numerically. So all of a sudden, we're living among strangers. And we introduce inequality. Now, we live in a society where there is a lot of inequality and a lot of strangers. And what, what we see from this, one of the consequences of the agricultural revolution is this inequality mixing with this reality of strangers to make us feel like, well, I, yeah, I maybe care about those people who are less fortunate, but at the same time, I'm just going to go about living my life. And for some people, just a flat out callousness of like, well, they should have worked harder. They should have done better. It's important to understand that these feelings of this feeling of superiority and inferiority don't exist for our species. Again, this is an experiment. How does this animal deal with the reality of inequality and the idea of feelings of superiority. Well, I don't have to care about those people. Nobody thought that. Nobody felt that way when it was 100 people and you knew all of them and you depended on all of them for your survival. Nobody felt that way. Now, we have that. That's just a part of our society. You, as an individual, may not feel it, but you can't deny that that's part of our society. So what happens when you put people, when you put our animal species into a society that has this? The results, again, suggest the results of this experiment are that some people end up having miserable lives, being homeless, not having enough to eat, becoming incredibly depressed. And it's because, it's, it's because we've set up a society that allows, that, that has this as a part of it, even though we didn't evolve to, to be in a context that had that. Um, all right, so we've got that. We have the first two, raising human standard of living and making a qualitative collapse possible. The last one that I want to talk about is that it, the agricultural revolution, the fourth consequence of it, is that it starts us down the road, oops, down the road of organizing society according to ideas. Rather than evolution. Now, in a way, we're so used to this that it's like, of course you're going to organize society according to ideas. Like, what else would you do? Again, it is important to organizing society according to ideas. Um, it's important to understand that that wasn't the way our species functioned for the first 300,000 years of us. We start this about, since this is 9,000 BC, we start this about 11,000 years ago. So what does, again, it's an experiment. What happens when you put this animal into a society that is that says, let's organize us according to our ideas? Um, some of those ideas are going to be fantastic ones. Some of them are going to be horrible ones. We in this country organized our society according to the idea that white people were superior to everybody else. That was an organizing principle. That was an idea. Um, we've also organized our society according to other ideas that were more helpful, like the idea that all people are created equal. That's a 
an idea that I prefer. But in either case, it's important to understand that we're not saying, okay, so what were we built for? And what's organized society according to that? It's whatever somebody comes up with that they can then persuade other people to believe in. Whatever idea, these are things that we come up with. Um, we are organizing our society based on that. And a lot of times, there, over the course of our society and most other societies, there have been people who have suffered because of that, because we have said, well, this is going to be the idea. The idea is that if you're not a communist, then you're horrible. The idea that if you aren't blonde haired and blue eyed, then you deserve to die. Um, all of these are just ideas that people invented, which to get us to sort of the end of this is kind of terrifying because what we are doing is basically making stuff up and then taking it as reality and saying, let's live our lives according to that. Again, to cycle back to an idea that I keep coming back to, the reason that I'm insisting to you that this is the most important class you're going to take. Um, the idea is these ideas are the structure, the, the context in which you live your life right now. And some of those ideas suck for you. They're horrible and they're detrimental to your happiness. And unless you understand that they are detrimental to your happiness. You're kind of just being pushed around. They are the water in which you swim that you're not aware of, as Marshall McLuhan said. So it bears um, taking a moment to understand that this, starting us down this road um, of organizing society according to ideas, there's nothing inevitable about the way our society is right now. It's not this way because it's just supposed to be. It's this way because some people came up with some ideas and said, hey, let's do this, and they were able to either persuade or force a whole bunch of other people to do it. That doesn't mean that that's how you should organize your life. It means that you should think about the fact that, okay, this is the society that I live in. How do I want to live in it, given the fact that some of these ideas I like and others of them I don't? All right, that's kind of a... Kind of a deep idea. Let me cycle us back to the, uh, the question that we were dealing with. How did we bend the laws of ecology? The first time was the agricultural revolution. And why it happened, we've talked about the results of it, we've talked about, and some of the consequences we've talked about. The next uh, video we have will be about the second time we bent those laws.